Welcome to the Dream, Plan, Start, Grow podcast hosted by Allison Turner. In each episode, we interview real everyday entrepreneurs to learn how they got their start, what challenges they faced and overcame when starting the business, and what successes each has had. Welcome to the Dream Plan Start Grow podcast. My name is Allison Turner. I'm your host, I'm also the founder of Bad Cat Media Group and Dream Plan Start Grow. Today we have with us Gary Broidis of Atlantic Commercial Group. So Gary, I know Atlantic Commercial Group hasn't been your first business that you created, which now is 22 years old. So I know you had an earlier business that you built and then sold. So sure. which business was that? So it was called, um, well, it was Net Properties Group, and we had two divisions. It was all internet uh, related. In the real estate business, uh, we had a division called HomeNet and a division called CenterNet. And it's really, the main business was HomeNet, and it was really one of the first real estate websites wow. uh, that we put residential realtors um, starting out in Manhattan, where I was based. And then we went, branched out to Westchester, Long Island, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Um, I always say, you know, one of my claims to fame is uh, we registered Barbara Corcoran's oh, business, yeah. Corcoran.com. And uh, she was like really the market leader in terms of uh, innovation. And right. um, mm -hmm. so we so designed and <laughs> yeah, so we designed and developed websites for real estate companies, got all their property listings online. Our attempt was to become the, you know, national multiple listing service. Wow. Uh, that was in the 90s, right? That was in 1995. And um, the Realtors Association started uh, putting together all their MLSs. And I saw the writing on the wall and said, there's really no way that we're going to be able to compete with them. They controlled all the data. And uh, so we actually ended up selling to a big advertising company in New York. And um, that's when I decided to move down to South Florida okay. and get back into commercial real estate where I had really spent uh, most of my working years uh, before that. Cool. So how did you, I guess my, my first question before we talk about the commercial real estate side in South Florida is how did you decide you wanted to start a business back in the 90s, you know, regardless of what business it was, which we just heard about, but how did you branch into that, like, like going from commercial real estate and then like, oh, I'm just going to start my own business. Sure. So my best friend growing up uh, was a very big uh, computer graphics designer and very, very talented. And he was just struggling with the whole business plan. He was a brilliant uh, programmer and graphics designer. And we just started spending more and more time together. And then uh, I finally decided to just go uh, in partnership with him. And uh, like I said, it was only about two years. Okay. Uh, and then that was in, we sold in 90, 1997. Okay. Oh, that's, that's good. Yeah. Probably once the MLS system was coming out, mm -hmm. <laughs> obviously the advertising agency that bought it, maybe didn't see the writing on the wall quite yet, but that, that is correct. <laughs> and then you came down here to South Florida and, you know, first worked for a couple of companies cause you were brand new to this area. Then what happened? Like, why did you decide to start your own commercial real estate group down here? Sure. So it, I always say it wasn't uh, by design. It was really by default. And um, I uh, came down, like you said, worked with two companies because I figured it was really the best way for me to get to know the people, the places, the properties. Mm -hmm. And um, it just the I had a great time. I enjoyed the people I worked with. I uh, made them a lot of money. Um, but my, uh, financial incentive plans didn't come to fruition. And, uh, so after about four years, the first four years down here, um, I decided to start my own company, uh, figuring, you know, now is the time to do it. If not now, when, right. So, <laughs> so that was like you said, in, in uh, 2000 and, uh, pretty scary times initially. <laughs> as most as most fledgling uh, businesses and entrepreneurs will know. 
Now, was it just you starting the company or did you start it with anyone? Uh, so I had initially a partner. Uh, we weren't, we worked together, but we didn't have a uh, so-called partnership. We had a kind of a co-sharing of revenue okay. uh, because my philosophy was I didn't want anyone to ride on my coattails and I didn't want to ride on anybody else's coattails. And so it was really kind of a training, uh, uh, really an investigative period. And then after about a year and a half, we decided to go, uh, you know, full board with the partnership. And then uh, about eight years later, in 2008, uh, he left the company and I took over the uh, balance of the company and, and okay. started running it from there. So it's been myself since 2008. Okay. And what were your scariest moments getting started in this, in the company? Uh, the ratio of income versus expenses. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, it was it was just very difficult to generate new business and get uh, enough income to really support myself and whatever support staff I needed. wasn't a big support staff initially. It was one one person full time. Um, but I just really just kept putting one foot in front of the other and just kept working really hard at it, building relationships, and uh, just kept digging and digging. And what I've heard with commercial real estate is the deal time you know from the start of it to kind of the finish is a really long t or can be a really long time compared to residential sure now i mean what what is the typical span i mean is there like an average or does it depend on what kind of deal we're talking about sure so you're absolutely correct um there there's different transactions in the commercial real estate world um i didn't i, I made a decision initially because i had done property management as well when I was in New York in commercial real estate. And I just kind of felt that property management for me was really just a, a, a lot of administration, a lot of mm -hmm. dealing with um, problems and issues. And I felt like if I can get to a point where I've got enough transaction volume, um, I didn't want to go into the management side. So leasing is obviously more short term revenue generation. Uh, property sales, however, are more time consuming and more lengthy periods of time, whether you're representing a buyer or you're representing a seller. Um, so I would just try to balance the two because the sales tend to be the larger transactions, even though leasing can still lead to uh, very good income and transactions as well, uh, depending on the size of the deal. So I always try to kind of balance the balance the two. Okay. And I know you were married at the time when you started Atlantic Commercial Group. Now, how did that impact? Like, did that impact your family at all? Did it impact how you did things in the company? Um, so, I, you know, I don't really know if it really impacted me. I mean, I did have full support of my wife. And, um, you know, again, it's, uh, you know, when you're starting out a business, there's a lot of <laughs> things that you have to do. And, you know, where you really just want to focus on, generating revenue and building your uh, new accounts, you also have to take care of IT and you have to take care of marketing and accounting and management. So <laughs> there's a lot of things that really go into it that kind of eat up a lot of your time. And I, I think that's what happens initially to a lot of businesses, a lot of young entrepreneurs. Um, you know, it's a lot of administration mm -hmm. that really goes into things that are non-revenue producing, but they have to get done. So yeah. that's why, you, have, you know, that's initially you have to ex excess income to pay someone else to do it. <laughs> correct. And that's why typically you're working, you know, 12 to 15 hours in, right. in the initial stages. Yeah. And I think that's where that family support's critical because, Absolutely. you know, a lot of people, especially if the spouse is working, but they're working a nine to five job or maybe they're a teacher or maybe they're a stay at home mom or wh whatever they are, mm -hmm. they're like, Okay, I haven't seen my husband all day, and now he's still not home. It's like nine o'clock at night. Like, sure. <laughs> so, you know, having that support and understanding, you know, because I think there's a lot of people that don't necessarily. Maybe they say they were going to understand, and then it happens, and right. then they don't understand. So, Correct. I think that's a critical a critical piece. And sure. as far as your kids, because I know you also had younger kids at that point too, mm -hmm. were you able to kind of carve out time with them around your busy schedule? I did. I, um, you know, I was the father that um, when I was growing up, my uh, my father worked, of course, uh, full time. My mom worked as well. And I decided that 
even though I was very uh, consumed by work and, you know, my time constraints were great and I had limited uh, off time in the initial, you know, few couple of years, I decided that I was going to go on almost every class trip that my yeah. children were uh, participating in. And it was great. I, you know, I loved it. My children loved having me there. Um, and, uh, you know, I love peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> Still to this day. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I tried to, I tried to take advantage of the, the schedule that I had that was really, you know, my own choosing. Right. Um, but we all get caught up in, in the time constraints. Yeah. Yeah. But it sounds like you made that intentional time so you could go mm -hmm. on the class trips. Right. And I think that's, you know, right. one of the things. I always talk to clients about is, you know, you, you know, if you work for yourself, there's certain things you can't control as far as your mm -hmm. schedule goes. You know, if a client wants X and they need it by this deadline and things like that. But, you know, there are certain things you can control and then you can educate your clients on like, OK, yeah, I can't do anything on this day from seven to noon or something like that. Sure. You know, but after noon, I'm yours. Right. So it's just Absolutely. being intentional and knowing what your boundaries are. Right. You know, with your clients. Um, yeah, and takes, customers. takes a lot of discipline. <laughs> yes, it does. And a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, the other interesting thing you mentioned is, you know, like when you first start, you know, you're doing the accounting, the sales, the marketing, the, mm -hmm. you know, all the different pieces and the implementation of the service. You know, so you're doing a whole lot more, you know, than when you worked for the commercial real estate company before where you were just transacting whatever that deal was. They probably sure. had the marketing strategy. I'm sure you did some of your own marketing just to get your own deals and whatnot, but mm -hmm. you know, but you didn't have to come up with an advertising budget necessarily to advertise a website or what do I need? Do I need to do SEO on my website? Do I need to do this on the website? You had to kind of figure those things out sure. as you went. So when did you get to the point where you could start farming more of that out to people that or experts in that those fields. So I'd say probably um, three to four years into uh, running the company, uh, we were able to put a little money into some extra marketing outside, yeah. mar you know, third party marketing assistance and some other services. But we we really did try to do a lot of it ourselves to not only mm -hmm. have more control, but also to obviously save on you know expenses for it. For those items okay and was a lot of your marketing and i'm sure a lot of it is just because i know the real estate business whether you're residential or commercial is such a relationship business so it was a lot of it going physically going out and doing networking events and mm -hmm. things like that yeah so i always balance you know networking events with going out for breakfast or lunch with people and just building those relationships uh conferences conventions um, really just, you know, getting involved in various chambers of commerce, mm -hmm. um, trying to, you know, always spread, you know, the, uh, the word about the services that we were providing. Okay. And I, I know the residential is highly competitive now how, and I don't really, I mean, I know fair, a few commercial realtors, but I don't know a ton, unlike the residential side where they seem to be coming out of the woodwork every day, you know, how competitive is the commercial it, it's it's Market. it's fairly competitive. Um, you know, I don't I don't know if I would say if it's either more or less competitive than you know residential, but you know it is a competitive market. There's you know only so many transactions that are taking place out there, and right. so the objective is to obviously capture as as much <laughs> as you can. can. And uh, but you know also in the commercial real estate uh, business, there's a lot of uh, business that you can generate. Okay. Um, because oftentimes in the commercial real estate world, it's not a business where necessarily people just drop deals and transactions into your lap, but you're really creating them. You're finding a property that may be not on the market because you have a client that you know is interested in purchasing, you know, these types of properties in these areas and these price ranges. So you go out there and you find them. Uh, so that I would say it, Probably that is about 30% of my business, even wow. today. So being a little bit more proactive on really knowing yeah. your, your clients mm -hmm. and then going after what they're looking for. Sure. So basically, so they don't have to, 
do any of the the legwork per se. Correct. Correct. You know, and you know, if you work in the commercial real estate uh, industry, you know, if you're working for a large owner of shopping centers, let's say, or office buildings, you know, you're basically given a number of properties that you're responsible for the leasing of those properties. Mm -hmm. So you really don't have to, you're not necessarily necessarily creating a lot of right. new business. Uh, you're trying to generate leads. You're trying to respond to inquiries. You're trying to network as well. Um, but obviously being in, in, in this industry as an entrepreneur, there's a lot of creation of deals and, and value to clients and really finding opportunities and, and presenting them in the right light, which it does take a lot of work. It takes a lot of experience. And, uh, but I, I do thoroughly enjoy it. Okay. No, that's great. That's great. Now, I know now your office is much bigger in 2022. I know you're headquartered in Delray Beach. Now, how many agents, commercial agents do you have under? I have 10 agents okay. currently. And they all generate their own business or some are generating stuff through you or how does that work? It's a combination. Okay. Uh, some agents are you know, more adept at creating new business opportunities. Um, others are you know, perhaps a little bit more dependent upon given being given, you know, various assignments. And yeah. uh, so my job is also, you know, to promote that generation of new business and trying to mentor these people who may not have as much experience right. and try to find those opportunities. Okay. And you mentioned mentor the people under you. So, I mean, are most of them when they came to your company, were they relatively new in the commercial side where they some had more experience like how like who are you hiring in that in so that? so it's, it's an interesting topic um <laughs> because i used to feel when i when i first started the company i felt that and this was after about four or five years or so where i had income coming in i had some accounts i had was generating transactions i felt that i can you know train young agents um, to become successful. And I think what I learned through that process is it's that's a very difficult task. And it also <laughs> takes a certain personality. Right. You have to have a tremendous amount of patience. Now, I do have a tremendous amount of patience. Um, but if you're spending most of your time doing that, managing people, training them, it's really taken away from your own production. Right. Um, and additionally, at the end of the day, if people move on to somewhere else, then all of your work was really for naught. So I reached a point, I think it was somewhere around 2006 or seven, uh, where I had 15 people and probably seven or eight were agents that were fairly, you know, with let's say less than three, four years experience. Okay. And so I think my mantra today is um, I really work more with seasoned uh, mm -hmm. agents and professionals. Um, but I, I have uh, over the last, you know, 15 years, I have, you know, certainly taken on a couple of uh, more inexperienced people and, and, and have helped them. And I'm happy to say that they're doing very well and still with me. So, so that's a, it's an accomplishment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I don't know the commercial side, but I know people jump in real estate in general. I mean, at least what I've seen in the residential side, I've mm -hmm. known people they are like, Oh, I'm with this company now. I'm like, weren't you just over here like two months ago? Sure. <laughs> yeah, so sure. I don't know if it's as much in your side of things or not, but, uh, I know uh, people are always like looking for the next shiny thing. It seems like, but, um, yeah. You know, no, that's true. You know, most people in our industry, um, you know, they'll sometimes jump to another firm because they're being offered a little bit greater incentive or perhaps a, a greater split on their commissions. Yeah. Um, oftentimes it's also about some people in the industry want to focus on a specific category within the commercial real estate industry, okay. and they may want to move to a company that's a little bit more specialized in that area that they that they desire okay and that makes sense mm -hmm. and then 
since we were talking about mentoring, did you have, like when you started your business, did you have a mentor that you looked up to? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm happy to say, and uh, it was uh, the person, uh, this man by the name of Earl Kazis, who was a self-made billionaire uh, from New York, who I always say to this day is my mentor for the rest of my life. Oh, wow. um, unfortunately, he passed away about a year and a half ago during COVID. Um, but this man showed me truly what it was, how to be a professional, a gentleman, respectful, <laughs> honest, uh, and just create relationships and give back. And really just, I, I was just always so impressed with him. And I felt like it was really a great honor to work with him. Uh, very well known man within the New York real estate industry. And, um, and to extend that a little further, his son-in-law uh, became a very close friend of mine 15 years ago when I got introduced to him. And just two days ago, we closed on our first deal together. Oh, wow. So it's, a, it, is, it is truly about <laughs> relationships and, um, you know, it really makes me proud and happy uh, because it's, it's like part of uh, Earl's legacy, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. oh, that's fabulous. You know, I think, you know, one of the points I like to emphasize to people starting up a company is, you know, to always have that mentor. You know, whether, I mean, it sounds like yours was in the industry. I mean, sometimes people have mentors outside the industry, you know, whatever industry they're going in you know, but maybe have taught them, you know, how to start a business. Maybe it's a different kind of business that this other person's in, but how to start a business, the work ethic, the kind of what it takes, the mindset that it takes, all the different pieces that have to be in play to really be successful as a business owner. Sure. You know, and then I think sometimes people need that one step further and, you know, they hire a coach as well. You know, and I mean, I know and even coaches need coaches. I mean, you always mm -hmm. hear that that thing, the, the mantra out there, you know, but it's always I mean, I find in, in owning a business like you're always learning because something's always changing. Sure. You know, in my in the online marketing industry, obviously, that's always changing. And you know, like Google could change their algorithm tomorrow. And like now something's changed and you got to figure out what what just happened. Like, <laughs> you know, or Facebook changes their thing or Instagram changes their deal. And sure. And it affects multiple things that you're doing with clients. Right. So how much, you know, do from your side of things, I know, do do you guys have to do like CEUs? Do you have to do like what what kind of education, like ongoing education do you have to do in the, the real estate arena? So obviously you'd have to take a real estate license as a salesperson. Mm -hmm. And then after uh, you have a couple of years experience, uh, you can take your broker's course and license, and that enables you to hire agents under you. Um, after that, it's every two years continuing education credits uh, that are offered through various schools uh, around the country. Okay. And then, I mean, do you find, I mean, I've heard mixed on CEUs in whatever industry, you know, depending on, you know, who, where you get them from, but what other learning sources do you use currently, maybe besides CEUs? Is it just more relationships, kind of like you were just talking about your mentor that, you know, how much you learned specifically from him. So is it more relationships that you learn the most from, you know, is it, are there ever deals that you put together in that the commercial side that is something like slightly different than you've ever done before? Mm -hmm. Like, is that change over time? So absolutely. I think that, you know, working on, um, you know, a multitude of different transactions and, you know, whether it's leasing, or sales transactions on uh, different property types, there's always nuances with, with almost every transaction. And one thing that I really truly love about the business is that I am, I feel like I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly learning mm -hmm. about new uh, transactions, properties. Um, you know, there's, there's a multitude of different uh, approaches that people take to investing. Mm -hmm. uh, disposing of assets, partnerships, uh, forming joint venture partnerships, which is very uh, predominant in the real estate industry. Uh, those can get pretty tricky. Uh, and so, like you say, I think you, the, the best learning experience is by talking to people um, and, you know, seeing what has been done before mm -hmm. and 
tailor tailoring those transactions to whatever your specific needs are. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think oh, always learning. And I think that's the, the one thing I always emphasize to people wanting to start a business or new entrepreneurs is, you know, there's never going to be a point where like, I've, I've got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you've got it, then maybe you should get out of that business. Sure. You know, because you've always got to learn, you know, and, and expand in whatever industry you're in. You've right. always got to be willing to kind of go that extra step and that extra mile and, you know, continue building. Right. You know, and, and what's a little unique about um, myself and my company is, like I said earlier, uh, most people in the commercial real estate industry tend to specialize in certain venue, in certain product types. Mm -hmm. um, but we, again, not by design, just by default, have been involved in, you know, so many different types of transactions and areas. And to me, I find that very exciting and stimulating to um, understand different markets and different property types. Um, you know, to me, I, I think I would get fairly uh, bored <laughs> if right. I was working on the same type types of transactions every day, whether it, whether they're just leasing or just sales or just retail or office or industrial properties. Um, you know, we've really been involved in, and myself, there's probably not any property type that I have not been involved with, uh, extending from multifamily, retail, office, industrial, um, sales and leasing. So. Okay. And has there been one deal, and I'm sure there's maybe even more than one, but that where maybe it wasn't your knowledge of the industry that pushed it through, but maybe it was more the either the mindset or the persistence or something else that happened that really got it done. Maybe it was a very difficult deal. Maybe it was, you know, a lot of pushback from, you know, whether it's the buyer or the seller. You know, is there one that comes to mind that where something, you know, that you were able to like persist through? Absolutely. <laughs> um, there's been a number of them, but one in particular um, involved a CVS drugstore uh, in Deerfield Beach on Hillsborough and Military Trail. Um, I was doing a lot of work with CVS and they were located in, in a uh, older premises for 20 so some odd years across the street from a freestanding Boston market that was on the corner. <coughs> and the, CV, the existing CVS was just in an inline space, you know, attached to a former Comp USA. And <laughs> we wanted to move them to a freestanding building across the street where the Boston market was. So I went to the owners of the shopping center. And I think this was somewhere around 2003. And I told them I'm representing CVS and we'd like to move them over to the corner. And they said, well, we would love them as well. However, Boston Market has a lease that expires uh, in 2018. So it was 15 years later. <laughs> and my response to them was, that's okay. It's only 15 years from now. I'm going to be working for another 50 years. <laughs> and so they kind of laughed it off. And, and I really, truly stuck with it um, for 15 years. Oh, wow. And <laughs> not only did I stick with it for 15 years, but the owners of the shopping center where the Boston Market was located went through five different uh, entity changes. Um, it, the property never changed hands, but the corporate structure and the entities changed five times. So with each one of those turns, their financial hurdles and benchmarks uh, kept changing as well. So when we couldn't make a deal with CVS, I would then talk to Walgreens. Then we went back to CVS and Walgreens. And then as the terms of the deal kept changing, uh, it, was, it was fairly frustrating at times, but I, I just knew that that's where they really needed to be and it was the best spot for them. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, in 2017, we actually signed a lease. It was 14 years after my initial oh, wow. uh, contact. <laughs> and in 2017, we signed a lease. Boston Market's lease expired in spring of 18 and <coughs> the building was demolished and CVS is there and doing very well. Yeah, that is persistence. <laughs> Jeez, 15 years or 14 years until you got to sign that lease. Mm -hmm. I don't know many I don't know many people in uh, any industry that would have held that long mm -hmm. <laughs> and that persistent. Yep. 
I'm that, a patient man. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really looking out for that client as well. Correct. Um, for CVS and really getting them that best, that best location. Sure. No, that's, that's a great, great story. So yeah. as we start to come to a close here, if someone was wanting to start a business, it doesn't have to be commercial real estate, but any business, like what would be the one tip you might give them? Like if they're brand new in business, never run a business before, you know, you know, in whatever industry, I, I don't, you know, cause I find that things go across, across mm -hmm. industries at this point, mm -hmm. what would maybe that one tip that you figured out, maybe you didn't know it initially, or maybe you did know it initially that really helped you mm -hmm. kind of build. I, I think that it would be um, maintain positivity. Um, keep putting one foot in front of the other. Don't ever get discouraged. Uh, realize that it's just there's going to be bumps in the road and you have to manage your expectations. Um, mm -hmm. Business, you know, I know it sounds cliche and we see these posters all over. It's not a destination. It's a journey. Yeah. And you have to really, truly embrace the unknown and embrace the process. Um, and if you really, truly believe in yourself and your abilities, I think that, you know, all of us can achieve anything that we want. I think that's that's a great statement because I I know for me that mindset's a huge piece. And you can see, you know, even in dips and the business, you know, like where mindset impacted things, you know, and where I, you know, you have to kind of auto-correct yourself, <laughs> like, sure. like, okay, wait a minute, you, you can't be thinking this way. You know, you have to kind of re redirect, um, you know, and, and keep moving forward, like you said, and like one step, one foot in front of each other, uh, in front of the other, <laughs> let's see if I can speak, you know, to continue <clears throat> moving forward. <clears throat> So I think that's a great, absolutely, um, a great tip. Now, if anyone had any questions specifically for you, what would be the best way to get in touch of, touch with you? Um, anyone can call me on my cell phone. The number is 561-703-9298 uh, or send me an email to gary at atlanticcg.com. Perfect. So thank you again for joining us today, Gary. Thank so you. Gary Broidis with the Atlantic Commercial Group headquartered in Delray Beach, Florida. My name again is Allison Turner. I'm the host of the Dream Plan Start Grow podcast. Just a reminder, if you have any questions for Dream Plan Start Grow or about this, you can certainly email me at success at dreamplanstartgrow.com. Check out our other podcasts at that website as well. We also offer a complimentary mat mastermind once a week on Clubhouse for an hour. So check the website out for that time, that day and time. You're welcome to join. You can ask questions. You can chime in on conversations. And we thank you. And we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Dream Plan Start Grow podcast with Allison Turner. If you like what you heard, make sure to subscribe and leave a review. Join the Dream Plan Start Grow community by following us on Facebook or Instagram at Dream Plan Start Grow. See you in the next episode. <laughs>